Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining today. Uh, a couple of quick announcements before we get started. Um, most of you have already done so, but I'm going to ask you to mute your lines. Uh, there's going to be a chance for question and answer at two different points in time in this presentation when you'll be able to take yourself off mute to ask questions. Um, one thing is if you are, if you've logged in for, with video, we'd ask you to go in and change your name in Zoom so that you can identify the state you're from and we would know quickly um, where you are from and, and, and for those of us who might not recognize your names. Obviously, if you've only called in by phone, you can't do that. So when, we, when you do ask questions, we will ask you to introduce yourself and to tell us what state you're in. Um, so uh, we're gonna get started. Today's session is on basically on the processes involving the non-competing continuation applications for the renewal grantees for year two, as well as your carryover balance requests. And um, basically after we finish each section, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, and we'll allow you to um, uh, ask those questions and, and before we move on to the next topic. Uh, so Missy, if you can change the next slide. Basically, um, while I'm going to do the presentation today, uh, I have two of my colleagues on as well, Sherry Harmon, who's our Office of Grants Management Specialist. Um, and some of you, many of you have probably interacted with her by email already. Uh, and Stephanie Gordon, who is the Grants Management Officer. Um, and uh, if you've requested liquidation extensions or anything, you've probably written that request to Stephanie. Uh, in either case, both Sherry and Stephanie will be available. And I'm going to um, give a caveat right now. <laughs> My expertise is in program, not in fiscal, uh, even though I'm doing the fiscal presentation. And therefore, I, I will say up front that if Sherry or Stephanie need to clarify anything I say or even correct anything I say, um, they will free, feel free to do so at any point in time in the presentation. And they'll be available, of course, to add additional clarification um, uh, during our Q&A yeah. period. Um, so basically, what I want, the last thing I want to say before we get underway is um, please jot down questions that you have. Feel free to use the chat and put your questions in there or comments in there as well. Uh, there will be folks who are kind of reviewing the chat for us and making sure that we can address questions that come in, although we will not take the questions until we finish each section. So we're going to go to the next slide now. <clears throat> and what basically this, uh, actually, let's go to the next one after that. <laughs> uh, so basically what we're doing here is the first and foremost what you need to know is that this non-continuing, non-competing continuation application is significantly less than what you submitted in your initial application. So those of you who are concerned, oh no, we have to do a whole new application. It's nothing like that at all. It's, 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 it's pretty much as brief as it can be by giving us the basic information. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the various pieces needed and the extent to which you have to write about them. But basically, the purpose of this is to zero in on what you're going to do in year two. Um, <clears throat> you, when you submitted your original application, the only real detail you provided was the general plan for the three years and then specifics related to year one. So we need to know a little bit more about what's going to happen in year two. And that may even be more different because of the, co the impact of COVID and, and how that's played out on your ability to carry out tasks and activities in year one. So you're briefly going to describe what you've accomplished or are projected to accomplish by the end of the first year. And that's going to set the stage um, in terms of what you're going to, uh, in terms of how you're going to build off of that for year two. So the idea here is that you are, we're gonna talk a little bit more about, you're gonna be, you'll talk briefly about what you've done in year one and the idea then is to say, and therefore, here's where we're going in year two. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so before we get into a description of the narrative or budget 
uh, or the project or budget narrative, let's talk a little bit about some miscellaneous information right, that's needed. Me. You're going to want to, um, and folks need to put themselves on mute if they're not on mute, please. <clears throat> And so, and, and there's nothing. Thank you. Um, so basically, before you go anywhere, before you start anything, we need a, we need a statement. And basically, it's a, your, your intent to continue the work. It seems unnecessary, but it is part of what is necessary. So you need to basically give a statement that you verify that the state is in a position to continue its work and that you accept the continuation award, that you're, that you're basically... Okay agreeing that you're going to accept this money. Um, in addition, the explanation, basically you're providing an explanation of how your unobligated funds from year one are going to be used in year two, if you're going to be carrying over, if you're gonna be submitting a carryover request. Now, I'm assuming based on conversations I've had with all the states that all of you are gonna probably be re requesting carryover. And so basically all you're doing here although there's gonna be a separate piece to that that's somewhat duplicative in when you actually do your carryover request. For this application, what you're doing is basically saying, um, here are the funds that we anticipate we will not be able to obligate by the end of year one, and this is how those funds will be used for year two. And then you will go into the description of what you're planning to do year two. In this way, you're clearly pointing out that there is not duplication of effort between what you're doing in year one and year two. Obviously, you build off of what you're doing in year one, but you're not doing the same thing. So you're clearly defining what's left to be obligated from year one to the best that you know at the point that you're submitting this application. And then you're going to talk to us about what you have to do in year two. Uh, as with the original application, you are going to be submitting your applicable indirect cost rate agreement or your justification for using the de minimis rate in year two. And this is what you did in year one, so it's no different than what you've done. You're just updating that information. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so basically, when we start with the project narrative, the idea here, as I've already said, is to explain your proposed work. What is it that has to happen in year two? Um, there's no page requirement. There's not, basically what you're doing is you're writing enough that we have an understanding of both in general and, and specifically, and what are the tasks and activities that are gonna happen with the money in year two? What are you going to be doing? So it can't be too general, but it, it, it doesn't have to get down into the l detail of what's happening every week, you know, that sort of thing. The idea is give us enough information so that we know what you're working on and the intent of those activities. Um, the narrative would clearly define the tasks and, um, and they go beyond the work that obviously is being accomplished in year one, as I mentioned previously. Let's go to the next slide. Similarly, you need to submit a budget narrative, and this is kind of like a crosswalk, right? Between basically, you've just told us what, the, what your project narrative is, what you intend to do in year two, and now we see we need you to explain the costs that are related to those various activities and tasks. What is going on in terms of what, what, what are you paying for, and, and how does that break out? This budget narrative clearly identifies the expected costs, and it goes beyond any obligated expenditures related. So if you've already obligated your funds in year one, you don't need to talk to us in this budget narrative about what you're doing with those obligated funds. You're just talking to us about the funds that are going, the new year two funds. Um, and you basically are justifying the cost by budget category, including the scope and the amount of each, each contract if you know those in advance. Um, so the idea here is that again, similar, to, it's basically mirroring the process you used for year one uh, in giving us an idea of what, what, what are you going to be spending your funds on. Um, and the idea here also is that, the, that um, you, will, you will, if you have any questions or if you're not sure what to do, you'll have a chance to ask questions today and also between now and the time you submit. But the other thing you need to recognize is this is a non-competing application, which means you don't have to worry, did you do it wrong, did you do it right? If you submit something to us and it's not enough information or it's not clear enough, we're going to come back to you and ask for more clarity or more.
this, maybe I won't get my second year funding. That's not, that's not at play here at all. Um, we still want you to pay attention to the detail. We'd rather not have to come back to you and ask for more, but, but clearly if there's something missing or something that we don't understand, we have the ability and, and the responsibility to come back to you and ask for that information. Let's go to the next slide. So for this application submission, basically, as I mentioned previously, you're telling us about your unobligated funds from year one. So to the best of your ability, now since you're gonna be submitting this document, this application in October, you're doing your best guess, the best information you have, and we're gonna revisit how you get to a more exact uh, area uh, exact description of that work once you get to the carryover balance request. But for now, you're making your best guess of the funds that you will not be able to obligate by the end of the calendar year. And therefore, what are those funds and what are they to be used for? Um, any amounts you actually request to carry over from, where, from year one are gonna actually be based on the real numbers that you indicate on your SF-425 when you upload it into the payment management system. And you won't be able to do that until the earliest you can do that is January and any time between January and March. Now, for those of you who are on, the, on this um, webinar from Kansas, Nebraska, or South Carolina, you, uh, for everybody, those are the three states that did not get awarded a renewal grant until the end of April. And so they're on a different timeline and we're gonna actually speak to them in a separate slide um, in terms of the timeline. But all the other obligations, all the other requirements are the same in terms of the content and the work that you need to do. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so one of the forms that you've had to submit uh, already when you've made a change, when you did a budget modification with your original application was the SF-424A. So in this case, this again is a, the form that you have to submit. You're going to reflect the amount of money on the desired line items. And basically, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll confirm with you, but you know that the amount of money you're getting in the second year is the exact same amount that you received in the first year. So it's the same amount for all three years. And, and so basically the total is that same amount that you're applying for. There is still a 30% match on that on that year's uh, funding. So you have to include the 30% match. And one of the things we wanna clarify that caused some confusion, basically we want you to separate out the non-federal match from the federal dollars. So there are separate columns, column for federal dollars, column for non-federal uh, dollars, and we want you to keep those amounts separate. Also, if you project or you know that the non-federal match is coming from multiple uh, line items, then we want you to reflect the amounts on those appropriate line items so that we know that your match is coming only from contractual or your match is coming across contractual and other in whatever other category you might indicate. So, so please do separate out how the match is going to be calculated and or, or where the match is going to be uh, uh, charged against and also obviously the, the, fed, the budget line items for your federal amount. Let's go to the next slide. So the additional items that you submit, you're gonna have a project abstract summary. So a brief summary of what, what's this all about? What, what are the basic elements that are taking place in year two? You're gonna have any key personnel again. In many cases, those key personnel will remain the same, but you wanna clarify them. And changes in grantee information and, what that, and, and if there are any. And in some cases, we have, ha we have situations where a grantee may be changing the department uh, that's going to be responsible for the grant or have other types of changes, maybe where the, where the office is located and that sort of thing. So any changes related to the grantee information uh, uh, you would want to include. You're going to also include what you've done in the past, the 424B, which is that assurances statement, as well as the disclosure of lobbying activities form. When you go into grant solutions, the, the grants management module application kit, we'll talk about that in a moment, you're going to see identified that you have to submit the SF-424C, but that is not something that you're gonna to have to submit for, non for the non-competing continuation application. So even though it says you have to submit it, you'll be able to ignore it, you won't submit it, and, it's, uh, and you don't have to worry about it. Let's go to the next slide. 
for most of you, I'm trying to remember if it's all of you, but for most of you, anyone who has a grant, an annual grant of more than $5 million needs to fill out the certification of filing and payment of federal tax form. Um, I believe that's all of you, but if not, it's close to all of you. And, um, and so anybody who's going to receive in their second year, $5 million or more, needs to fill out this form uh, as, as one of the additional requirements. If your grant award is less than $5 million for the second year, then you wouldn't have to do that. Let's go to the next slide. So the window for submission is October 1st to the 15th of 2020. Um, so next month. Um, the, the idea here is if you, you shouldn't submit before October 1st, and you really shouldn't submit after October 15th. However, we do recognize that sometimes situations arise that require additional time, different uh, uh, situations. If that happens, like any other situation, you would request an extension of time um, and uh, explain the reason why you need more time and also indicate the amount of additional time needed. Um, and we, our goal is to have no extensions uh, unless there was a, a, a significant emergency. We don't wanna have any continuation applications that come to us after October. But we wanna have enough time, we have to review them and then generate them, prepare them for the uh, next award. So it says here, failure to submit continuing application during this period could result in discontinuance of funding. And that is a true <laughs> statement. Uh, obviously, we would work with you to make sure that didn't happen, but we cannot fund you the second year without a continuation application. The effective start date of your year two award is December 31st of 2020 regardless of what date the grant award is issued. So you may get a grant award issued December 22nd, it's still the effective date of the award is gonna be December 31st. Now this is where I have to do a PS, not about this, but about your initial grant. So any of you who have an initial grant where you got a no cost extension and that no cost extension is going to the end of December, please note, regardless of whether you asked for an extension to December 31st, your extension is only to December 30th. So in closing out your initial grant, you, you will be closing out that initial grant by December 30th, not December 31st. And December 31st is the start, is going to be the start of the new grant each year. And December 30th is going to be the end date of that grant each year. So please keep that in mind if it's something that you um, may not have paid attention to or thought that you might have had an additional day. In most cases, you won't need it, but let's uh, want to be clear about that. So um, let's go to the next slide, which I believe is the alternate slide, right? So basically for Kansas, Nebraska, and South Carolina, basically everything that I've said to you is the same for you. The only difference is that you're on a different timeline. So the time frame for which you would be submitting your non-competing continuation application is between February 1st and February 15th. Your award was made April 30th and your grant is scheduled to end April 29th and therefore the effective date of this year two award will be April 30th, um, regardless of the date that that grant award is issued. Um, Again, similarly, any amounts you actually request to carry over, you're gonna be carrying over um, after. You won't be able to, to, to put in that request before May, and you'll have between May and July to submit based on when you submit your final SF-425. So if you're ready to submit that SF-425 on May 2nd or May 3rd, then that's fine. If you May 25th, that's fine, or any time up to and into July. Um, that means that you won't know about the carryover balance. You won't have approval for the carryover balance until you've submitted that and, and uh, we've approved it. Now, just as a repeat comment, at the time you submit your non-competing continuation application, you're making your best guess of what your unobligated funds are going to be and what's going to need to carry over. Now you'll know for sure and you'll be obviously acting on the reality 
of what you uh, still have to obligate um, and that you're going to be requesting to carry over into the next year. Let's go to the next slide. So as I referred or mentioned previously before, um, the idea here is that, the, that your application request is done in Grant Solutions. So it's processed, it's viewed by you, it's started and processed in Grant Solutions. Um, you should be able to, uh, because it's only, only the renewal grantees are on this call, all of you qualify for a non-compete application and therefore when you go into Grant Solutions, you should be able to see under my grants list, you should be able to see the display that for a non-compete application and the, and the related links. The grantee then selects the apply for non-competing award link and basically the process begins. If you have, if you don't find that my grants list showing that you have a non-compete application available, then you would contact Sherry Harmon. And we're going to talk again later on about who to contact, but she would help correct that. And once you start the process of applying, if you have questions about forms or something's not working in Grant Solutions, you can contact Sherry, but, but generally speaking, the Grant Solutions help desk would probably be the first place you would go. Okay, let's... Um, go on to the next slide, which I believe is the summary and then question and answer period. So just in summary, basically, this is a much briefer application that includes your project and your budget narrative, uh, sufficient detail that we understand what you're doing. You don't have to go overboard. We certainly don't, we don't have a page limit, but we, so keep it brief, but at the same time sufficient that we all understand the work that's gonna get done. You want to include an explanation of your unobligated balance, to, un, unobligated funds to the best that you know it. You're going to submit an SF 424A and B. You're going to indicate the non-federal match in the appropriate line items on your SF 424A. You're going to include a lobbying activities disclosure. And in cases where your award is greater than $5 million, you're going to include the certification of federal taxes form. You're going to submit all this in Grant Solutions sometime between October 1st and October 15th. If we have questions, we'll follow up with you and ask for clarification or further information. And Kansas, Nebraska, and South Carolina, you will be submitting on the time frame of February 1st to February 15th, but all the other information stays the same. So with that, I know that there's been some chatting going on and maybe some answering going on, um, but I am going to open it up and maybe we start. Uh, Sherry or Stephanie, I think you guys have been trying to answer questions in the chat. And so maybe one or both of you would like to um, tackle any question or we could just start at the top. Anybody have a preference? <laughs> Stephanie and, and, and Sherry, no preference. take yourself off no, I, Yeah, no, I'm just trying to uh, respond to some of the questions and like always, I'm sure it's a little um, technical for um, this platform. Um, I think there were questions um, in regard to like what would be an unobligated balance and just kind of quickly you would find the answer to that in part 75. Um, so you can go to the definitions in 45 CFR 75.2 and uh, the three items you'll find there are unliquidated obligations, an obligated balance and obligation and that'll probably help you understand um, you know how to or your um, you know uh, finance department how to account for and report on the federal financial report properly um, there's another question um, I, I think it's in regard and I'm not understanding it from from David um, it, it has to do with carrying over funds, but it, it seems to be an assumption that they're the same amounts for years one and two. So I guess we're talking about a few different things here. There's, you know, the amount you received in year one, which will be the amount you'll also apply for in year two. Um, that's your NCC application, which Richard's talking about um, um, very uh, in depth right now. Then there's another separate pot of money that was the year one money that you weren't able to obligate. And that money will have the ability to be carried into year two. 
it won't be used. So there's two types of carryovers grantees have probably seen. Those are the types that increase your award and the types that decrease your award. This will increase your award. So the carryover for preschool development will give you the opportunity to um, apply to use funds in year two that were unspent um, for allowable um, items in conjunction with what you apply to do with your preschool development grant. Um, Ms. Stephanie, I'm going to add to that. So to the question, is there an updated budget narrative required for the carryover? I mean, in the applicate in the non-competing continuation application, you are just going to be telling us, you're going to be giving us a brief description of what's unobligated, what's going to be carried over, and you're just going to just basically tell us what it is. What is it for? What is it? What is the purpose? You don't have to go into any extensive narrative description there. Yeah. Can I point out on you, that too with you, Richard? Because you had talked about before it might be repetitive with the year yeah. two application. I don't even think it would be repetitive because I think what we're really just looking for the year two application repetitive to the COB application. I think the year two application as you said, it's really just general. I think it's based, I, that's a requirement that comes from our policy manual. And I think that's required just because of the grantees telling us they wanna do something like, you know, maybe very unorthodox that like, we're gonna use the money to um, install 800 playgrounds around all of our state. Um, that may give us, that would give us the opportunity to have more time to discuss with the grantee, maybe something more in line with PDG or, you know, push it up to our attorneys to see if it's <coughs> So I think that's what we're looking for is something general enough to just kind of understand the request so we can expedite the processing of those COB applications upon receipt. Um, sorry to interrupt, but that's what I kind of always see that mm -hmm. funding application um, and that explanation of the COB just to kind of understand. So if it's really off base, we kind of have time to let you know that before you come up with a whole application of a COB and a whole idea. And then we tell you, wait, we, we can't approve this. So I think it's to, to mitigate grantees doing work they don't need to. There's a question here that asks, is there a particular format or template for the budget project narrative we should use or follow? And are there any examples that can be shared? Um, I don't have a particular template or format, but I don't know if we do in grants management that says complete your budget narrative in, in this, with this tool, do you? Do you? I'm not aware. Um, grantees are usually held to the same requirements as um, a FAWA, that it's not to exceed a certain page level. It's supposed to be in, I think, what Times New Roman 12, um, certain margins on pages. Um, Sherry, if, if, if you're more specific, but um, I, I think it's really taking the kind of setup requirements that were required for your FAWA. And then um, last grant, is, yeah, would we be okay using the same format as our last grant, assuming we met all requirement? Yes. Right. So um, that's, I think, what I'm trying to say here is that you can usually use that because to get through the screening process, it would have had to have met the requirement. Okay. All right. I think the intent here, I mean, the for, the formal document is the 424A. That's kind of our required um, funding, you know, document. And then the budget narrative is really to support that and to expand on that. And it, I don't think the intent is for us to give you a specific um, format or whatever. Um, it can be however you represent that information, you know, for your own tracking um, and use. Okay, so there was, thank you. So there was a question here about executing contracts. Um, States currently don't have documentation that demonstrates that we'll be approved for year two funding and or a carryover of funds until we apply and you approve. This means that all contracts must end December 30th, 2020. By the time we get year two approval, we'll be in a rush to amend dozens of contracts and community grants and have gaps in implementing the work. Any okay, so that's a loaded question. Can I, can I yep. that's a very loaded one. Can I just take that one piece by piece? So, all contracts must end December 30th, 2020. Um, that might be a, a specific state policy. I don't think that's um, an overarching policy. I think contracts in part 75 need to have exit clauses such as that if required, but I don't think it, it means you have to look to terminate your contract December 30th, 2020. Um, by the time you get year two approval, we'll be looking to, so in a competitive year, approvals are kind of, you get them really last minute, right? It's the day before the budget period, the project period starts. 
Um, as Richard said, we're hoping to have all these applications in in early October. I really do want to I sign the extensions for um, providing for applications to come in late and I have not signed one since COVID's come or it's it's I don't really see any a reason to have to sign that it, you should be able to get your application application in timely. Um, so if you can have it in in early October, we're hoping to process these, you know, end of October, November, um, as soon as we're kind of set up for our fiscal year to have our, our accounting numbers. So if we are award, we can get this contract, our, our grant out to you um, a month or two in advance, that'll also give you the, the instrument you need. The money won't be available to you in the payment management system until 12-31-2020, but um, you should have that legal binding agreement with us for you. Um, so hopefully you're not in a rush to, to amend things, um, but if your state does have procedure policies and procedures in place like that, um, maybe you should be talking to your procurement um, or somebody in your state to um, kind of, I, I think this is a pretty standard grant processing and this is the way HHS does it. So um, you may be thinking up this in the future again. So there's actually a slide in the next part of the presentation on carryover balance where basically I, I, I let you know that there is no intent here for you to stop work. There's no work stoppage. Okay, so just because you didn't get a carryover balance, um, once you get your grant award for year two, um, you have funds in place and we will talk to you about the ability to just continue the work that you have because obviously, even though you don't know what's going to have happen with carryover funds, let's let's assume in a worst case scenario, you requested the, the a carryover fund, and for some reason we had to dis disapprove it or disapprove some portion of it. Then we would have to work with you to make some adjustment on how you would adjust your scope of work to reflect that. But the reality is, we're not expecting you to all of a sudden stop contract work on January 1 because you haven't gotten an approved carryover balance yet. You'll be able to work simultaneously on year one and year two activities um, with a kind of an assumption that things are going to work out until they don't. And then if they don't, we have to work with you to fix that. So there was, there was a couple of questions. Um, to, and uh, so yes, everybody's going to get the Q&A the Q in the chat. So rather than reading every question in the chat and, and in some cases answers were provided that are somewhat lengthy. I won't do that here because you're going to get those answers. But there were some there were some questions here that have that we should take a quick look at. So I'm just kind of scrolling down. Um, <clears throat> so you can use the same format on the last grant. Um, you basically use the SF 424 only to put in the amounts related to year two, not the unobligated funds. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, the uh, obligated, the answer to uh, the funds obligated by 1230, but that cannot be liquidated in the 90 day liquidation period. Um, that is not um, available for carryover. That would be a liquidation extension request. Um, and uh, for the initial grants you're talking about, right, Stephanie? Yes. So, so sometimes we see grantees with both. So when your year one ends, you may have um, obligations that couldn't be liquidated in the 90 days, and you may have an unobligated balance. You could have both. Um, so you really need to thoughtfully look out at the outstanding um, expenditures to ensure that you or your um, accounting departments are classifying them properly so you can make proper requests. So there's a question here about the percentage of funding for subgrants. So as you know, in the legislative language and in the funding announcement, you are allowed to use up to 60% of your grant awards for subgrants in the first year and up to 75% in years two and years three. So if you're going to up the percentage, if you're going to, that would be something that you describe in your project narrative. It would also be something that your costs would reflect in when you, when you submit your budget narrative. Uh, let's say funds obligated by 1230, but not liquidated. Yep. You, so you, you mm -hmm. talked, you answered that question already, Stephanie. Um, I think Sherry, I think the three of us are kind of tag teaming each other to answer them. Good. I think we've gotten to them. <laughs> so I think what I'm going to do is just ask anyone now, if you haven't put something in the chat or even if you did 
and you don't feel you have the answer you need, this is a chance for you to take yourself off of mute and to ask your question. Um, so if anyone has a question, please feel free to take yourself off mute, identify yourself, what state you're from, and ask your question. Okay, not hearing any questions. I'm going to assume that you're satisfied for now. Um, this is being recorded, so you will be able to share it with others who may not have been able to join or also to um, listen to the, the, the responses that Stephanie and Sherry provided as well. And you will also um, receive the, the information that is in the chat. So you'll have that as well. So we're gonna move on to the second part of the presentation, the carryover balance request. Obviously, some of this has already been addressed in some, to some degree. So let's take a look at the rest of the information and we'll take it from there. So <clears throat> as I've already said, the, the fact of the matter is that you cannot, you will not be able to make your carryover balance request until you actually submitted your final finance, SF-425 financial report in payment management system. And the way that works is that you will basically, um, it may, so uh, how do I wanna say that? It could be submitted as early as January, but you're gonna see in the next slide that there's a block of time or a period of time that you have where you can submit that carryover balance. The point is, do not submit a carryover request if you have not submitted the SF-425. We won't be able to process it until we see that actual report. Uh, and again, the thing to note is that all of your fiscal action is taking place through grant solutions. So other than like putting your, your federal financial report in payment management system, anything you're requesting in the way of a budget mod, a carryover request, a continuing application, all of that is done in grant solutions. So, so similarly, when you get ready to do your carryover amendment request, you will do that in grant solutions. Let's go to the next slide. Richard, can I just kind of grantees? Yeah, yeah, please. Can, yeah, yeah, grantees can, or can apply for the the carryover any you know it, as soon as they're ready to prepare the application. We just won't be able to process it until we have that annual 425. But if they'd like to work on it, which we actually really promote, grantees can you know start their application January, February. So by the time they submit the report in March and we get notification of that, we could be ready to fund it very quickly for them. So. Um, we can. That's great. Thanks for that clarification. That's why you guys are on the call. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's something I didn't know. <laughs> okay, so, so the next slide. So basically, requests for carryover should be initiated once the actual and obligated balance is known. And then basically the federal cash transaction report is available January 1st, which is why usually you can then use that um, to to generate and submit your SF-425. Basically, what this means is you only, you're, once you know what your unobligated balance is, once you know what, you're, what, um, what you need to take action on, as you just heard Stephanie say, you can submit that at any point in time. And then once we have that final SF-425, we can process. Um, what I should say is that, um, any change in the purpose of funds. So let's say you're coming to the end of the year. You know this year we've given you certain flexibilities related to COVID realities that you're facing. And so in general, what you should be doing, what you should have been doing, is that if you were going to change the intent of some funds or you were hoping to change the intent of the use of some funds, you submitted a request um, and you said basically because of COVID or, uh, or, or whatever, the, let, let's take the example of those of you who were going to do an annual meeting. And you, well, we're not going to be able to do the annual meeting in person anymore. We therefore would like to use these funds to do X. Um, you want approval for any of the requests that are going to change what the original intent of the funding was. So if you're going to push forward an unobligated balance, um, you want to also have approval. Obviously, 
you'll have approval for anything that already exists, but if you're making a change, you want to obtain that approval um, before you submit your request so that you know that when you're submitting the request, you've already been given the approval by both your grants management office and your federal project officer. So that probably won't be a factor in most cases, but if there is something changing, make sure that's part of the discussion before you submit the request. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So basically, um, <clears throat> yeah, so basically uh, requests for carryover uh, are including only your prospective course and activities. So basically it's ones that you are going to incur or that's going to be undertaken. So the idea here is if you've already, if you've already incurred costs, if you've already obligated funds, then you're not, that's not part of this request. It's not something you need to worry about. You're only taking care of those things that were not already addressed prior to the end of the previous year. Um, and this is kind of what I was saying a moment ago, carryover funds are used for the purposes for which they were originally authorized or any other purposes that have been approved by the FPO and the grant specialist. Let's go to the next slide. What I said earlier here, so there's no work stoppage expectation. You're not gonna stop work and all of a sudden say, oh, I can't work on anything else I was working on because I didn't get my carryover yet. Once you have the second year award funding, you basically are going to be borrowing from that second year award funding, so to speak. You'll be using that second year award funding to allow you to continue to do the work you have to do. And then when your carryover balance is approved, assuming it would be approved, that amount of money just gets added to that second year funding and obviously becomes part of the funds you have to spend in that second year. Um, basically, in reality, you're probably going to be working on tasks that are identified as part of your year one tasks and tasks that are identified as part of your year two tasks simultaneously. And, but there's no expectation here that you should stop work once you have grant funds in your possession. So the next slide, okay, really quick. That was kind of pretty quick process. I think it's pretty simple. It's, it's, it's not so different um, <clears throat> from, um, well, I probably shouldn't say this because I don't know that it's true. So never mind, I'll, I'll, I won't say it. Uh, what I was going to say, what, what I want to say is basically any questions that you have when you submit about carryover balance, again, uh, Sherry uh, is going to be available to answer those questions and Stephanie obviously is available, but she supports Sherry um, as needed. Um, and so Sherry will answer all fiscal related questions. Um, I will continue to ask or answer all program related questions. Um, and so as you move on in trying to do either, the, either of these um, requests, um, please reach out to us as you always have been doing. Um, as Stephanie mentioned previously, and I want to just repeat it because it wasn't part of the plan presentation. Um, if we're talking about your initial grant and you need an extension of the liquidation period, you'll be sending in a particular request to Stephanie and she will approve or, or not. She'll tell you what she needs related to that what liquidation extension. But there are no, I think everybody knows this, but there are no additional extensions you can add to your initial year. And so, so either your grant has ended or will end in September and or it will end December 30th in, uh, of 2020 in terms of the funds that you have to obligate. And then you'll have your liquidation period to, to take care of the rest of those, those activities. So um, Stephanie or Sherry, anything else you wanna add that I may have missed or anything to clarify? Uh, Richard, can you just go back one slide? I did want to kind of piggyback on your, your last bullet a little bit. Thanks. Um, so it is, so, so as Richard's saying, that's even true for fiscal, that you'll be carrying out tasks related to year one and two simultaneously. Um, you know, as we're talking about, you have the 90 day liquidation period. So you're going to be really busy between the two grants um, at, you know, in January, February, March, and you need to keep straight what you're doing. I just saw another question from Tanil, which, which kind of goes along with that. You have to be mindful that you have year one funds and you have to make sure you're making those obligations in year one. 
And after you have year two funds, those obligations need to be applicable to year two. Um, and then you also have the liquidation periods. You have to make sure you're liquidating your obligations. So it can get a little tricky. So you need to really keep the two grants um, budget periods distinct during that time. Uh, that's usually for new grantees. Um, not, not shocking, but you know, something that you need to kind of get a system in place to, to ensure you're, you're doing in a manner that works for you. So don't be, don't think you're doing something wrong if you feel like, well, I have, I'm paying this grant, I'm, I'm paying off things in year one, but now I'm make, I'm incurring new costs in year two. You're probably doing it right then. So don't get too nervous that you're kind of working between the two grants a lot. And especially since we have a lot of carryovers with this year two, don't get too confused. A That's a question. really important clarification. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh. Um, so any other questions that folks have? So seeing to Neil's question too, to just kind of piggyback, it sounds like it could be if that's the way that your contract office is working, where you're going to be obligating parts of the contract to year one. We also do see, you know, I think that one can go based on the way your state um, is going to manage it. We do see some people making obligations for contracts. Um, we, we do see some people making obligations for contracts in one year in that, you know, liquidation period extending out into the next year. Um, you would have the opportunity also to just obligate from the one year to carry it over to obligate into the next year. I think you could do that one either ways, and you know you would really want to talk to your state's um, procurement office, understand the way they they do that with contracts. But both ways work. Um, and carryover funds actually uh, exist for the time for the period of the entire year. Mm -hmm. So basically, once you've carried over the funds, you now have the entire year of 2021 to to deal with those carryover funds to address yes, they basically yeah they basically take on the identity of year two funds so once they go into there they take on um that uh budget period end date that liquidation date so once they're carried over you receive all the same but they go on to that 425 i did want to kind of mention too um when you met uh mentioned the matching richard you would be expected to also match your carryover balance at the same 30 percent so it's not that we carry, the, you, so once your award increases, it will also increase your non-federal match that you'll be expected to generate. So you do have to be mindful of that. That is part of a carryover application to explain your non-federal match. Um, However, so I think, and I think this is correct, if a state decided to pay a 30% required match up front this year, to the total so amount of the first going year. going to award. carry over the non-federal match with the, so, so they're carrying over the non-federal match also? Well, that's my question. If they paid the 30% of the total amount, would, mm -hmm. would that be considered paid or would they be carrying over the non-federal match that? Well, they wouldn't be expected to match. So the, the match is done on your actual expenditures. So what would happen in year one is they wouldn't be matching the whole grant if they have a carryover balance. So, I see. so yeah, they're only matching um what they expend so that that's a really good point richard is so when you look at your ffr it's line 10e that is you're going to be expected to match 30 percent of that number it's not going to be the amount authorized which i think is 10d okay and then there's a question here if activities are pushed from year one to year two mm -hmm. resulting in the need to request carryover should we reflect the activities in the continuation or the carryover request or both. Um, and so the idea here is if, if activities in year one, okay, let's put it this way. If act, so there's two different things here that are, go, that are were at work. The one might be that there's an activity that you had planned to do in year one for which you have dollars and, and you just didn't get to obligate those funds because of delay you're rolling over those dollars now, you're carrying over, you're putting in a request to carry over those dollars to carry out that work. And that is taken care of in your carryover balance. It's gonna be mentioned in your non-continuing application because you're gonna be talking about what, what still needs to be obligated, but you're going to more fully describe it or discuss it in your carryover balance request. There are some, there may be some situations where a state had an activity planned for year one, where they said, because of COVID, there's no way I can do this in year one right now. 
I'd like to switch places. I'd like to kind of move this activity to year two and move an activity I plan to do in year two to year one. So basically I'm just shifting your, I'm asking for approval to change what I'm doing in which year. In, in that case, and I'm not sure this has happened. I've heard us talk about it. I don't know that I've ever seen the actual request, but in this, in such a case, if you were approved to take an activity out of year one and move it to year two, then it's considered a year two activity. It's a, it's a separate activity now. I don't think you actually, anyone actually asked for that, but it was a question that came up in a prior um, webinar or session where we wanted to know, could you exchange activities from one year to the next? So if that is a situation you have, my advice would be to reach out to your federal project officer and to me, and let's just talk about it to make sure that we're in agreement. And then we'll talk to Sherry about it as well so that we're all on the same page. This is Sherry. I just wanted to go back to um, Joanne's question about carryover ending March 31st. Okay. So March 31st or March 30th actually is the due date for, or actually it's April 30th, isn't it? I don't know. The is when, no, it's March 30th, is when the 425 has to be submitted. But um, if you're not prepared to request the carryover at that point, you can still submit it within that year because um, we can carry it over any time during year two, from year one to year two. I think we actually have flexibility now to even skip year two and go all the way to year three. Yeah, sure. Right. It's just, like it's just that, that we need to know what the unobligated balance is reported on that 425. So the important piece is that we can't do the carryover until we have that report, but that doesn't limit you to only um, requesting it at that time. Yeah, I think Richard and I are really kind of focused on doing it quickly for you, but there may be grantees that are, um, you know, more, more methodical, you know, need a little more time to maybe you're requesting a liquidation extension or, you know, and it'll take you longer than being able to submit by March. I mean, that that's fine too. We can entertain it anytime during year. A carryover for year two can be performed anytime during year two. Um, and as I mentioned, if we're running out of time in year two, we could, you know, move the application to year three and do the carryover into year three. So there are flexibilities available that to work for you. And I know that the terminology is sometimes confusing. So again, we talk about continuation requests and carryover requests. The continuation is basically the ability to get year two funding. It is nothing, it's, it's the continuation application is just how do I go about getting my second year of funding? The carryover balance is how do I request funds that were not obligated in year one to be moved into year two so that they can be spent, so that they can be obligated and expended in year two. So the terminology sounds almost the same, but basically continuation application is about ability to receive the year two funds and carryover balance takes care of the year one funds, moving it into year two. Any other questions folks have? Okay, hearing none, we look forward to receiving your applications. Um, and uh, obviously, again, just to repeat, if you have any concerns or questions um, um, th that are fiscal in nature, please re reach out to Sherry uh, Harmon. Um, her contact information is in the presentation, but most of you have it already. Um, and if it's a programmatic request, you can reach out to your federal project officer or to me. Um, and we'll try to answer those questions as quickly possible. Our intent is to use um, the period of time in, um, in late October to start reviewing all these applications, making sure if there's any other clarification or information that's needed, we can come back to you for it um, because we, it, it's gonna take us a little while to just get through them all. And just as a reminder, there will be another competition taking place, even though it's a smaller number of states. Um, and so um, we, we're going to have to just make sure everything is moving along um, since there's only Sherry on the fiscal side with Stephanie supporting her and all and mostly me on the programmatic side in terms of the sign off and grant solution. So 
uh, we want to make sure we can get everything done in the time it needs to get done. So any, uh, Missy, any last comments or questions from you? Um, no, thank you. We will follow up and Richard and I will work on getting the, the materials out to you all so you can share them with your team. Okay, thank you everybody. I hope you found this useful and we were able to answer your questions. And obviously if not, continue to ask. Thank you all, have a good day, take care of yourselves. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, have some fun. Bye. Thanks Stephanie and Sherry.